Judge, thank you so much for doing this again. Thank you for having me. Um, you didn't wake up one morning as a judge. So uh, there's a path that got you to where you are. And so I was wondering if you could uh, start us off this morning by talking about that path, uh, what, what led you uh, to, uh, to law school, and then the, the, you had a series of very interesting jobs uh, leading up to your appointment to the bench. And so I was wondering if you could help the students with that, that background. Well, like many of you, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer very early in life. Um, when I was in first grade, I wanted to do one of two things, either be a missionary or a lawyer. Um, I really wanted to be a missionary. I um, went to private school pretty much all my life, private religious school, and my mom said to me, um, you can't be a missionary because they don't make any money. So, you know, if your parents say it, that's it. <laughs> so, um, I, she said, well, you need to be a lawyer because you like to talk and you like to argue. And so I thought, okay, I'll do that. But even when I was in first grade and came up with this idea, my reason for wanting to be a lawyer, I guess kind of like a missionary, is because I wanted to make a change. I wanted to make a profound impact on our society in a way that I thought many times in being made. And so I pursued that course. So I went through school. I um, graduated from law school. I went to um, UGA. And when I graduated, all while I was in law school, I knew I wanted to make a difference. So I didn't get bogged down in the things that I think traditionally students get bogged down in. But after I left law school, I went to work for a civil rights law firm, one of the only kind in this country in that they majored in being diverse. So for instance, they had Jewish lawyers, white lawyers, black lawyers, females, males, and they, whoever left, that was the characteristic of the person they had to hire. So luckily for me, the person who had left before me was an African-American female. So when I went to interview at the firm in Charlotte, North Carolina, I fit the bill, um, and they um, did many interviews with a lot of people, and they offered me the position. It was the most unique experience of my life. Um, I was in a setting that was more reflective of what America will become, and people who thought in a way that was beyond the obvious. Um, I did that for three years, came back to um, Georgia, had been um, a student of Ken Malden, who was then the solicitors in athens Clark County, and I thought, okay, I can do misdemeanors, because that's not really working for the man. <laughs> so uh, I did misdemeanors for about two years, loved trial work, that was what I knew my, that was my gift, I knew that in law school based upon mock trial and court experiences, and so loved it to death. Um, left there, went to work for Atle um, Clark Atlanta University for about eight or nine months was not a good experience, and so I left there, uh, but I learned to do a lot of things. Um, got the chance to meet many famous rap artists and all of that, because I was doing the contracts for them when they would come on the campus. Um, and then after that, I went to the DA's office, so I guess I decided to work for the man. Uh, <laughs> and I worked on a person by the name of Bob Keller, who most of you all probably won't know, but your parents might have heard of him. He was the longest sitting uh, DA at the time, the most rewarding job I ever had. Um, we could prosecute our cases. He treated us like professionals. Um, I became the, the renowned as the baby murder uh, prosecutor, so I did all the cases where ba children were murdered and loved it, um, and did a lot of different things. What left from there went to the U.S. Attorney's Office, where I was um, there for 14 years. Did kind of everything you can think of, some things that our office had never done before, just because I wanted to continue to grow. And so, um, had a very rewarding experience. How I came to be on the bench, um, and I, I was very candid last time, so I'm going to be as candid this time. Um, working there for 14 or 15 years, I had kind of done everything, seen everything. I knew I needed to, I wanted to continue to grow. Um, to me, you're either doing one of two things at all times of your life. Either you're growing or you're dying. Because nothing can stay stagnant except for stale, stinky water. And so my thought was, I, I don't think I'm growing anymore. I think I'm staying still. And so I started looking for things myself. Um, to do. I thought, okay, I, maybe I'll go to D.C. The thought was to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office there, then maybe catapult into the White House and somehow be counsel there. And so I did all my maneuvering and actually talked to some people in D.C. who said, um, yeah, you can come aboard, but this is the deal. For five years, you've got to go back down to doing misdemeanors because their superior court and U.S. Attorney's Office is all combined. And so that's the way it works. Maybe you'll only do that a year, maybe only two years, based upon who you are. But we can't guarantee you that. So I would have had to move my family. Uh, my mom would have had to retire and move with me so I could have someone to help me with child care. And I just thought about it, and I thought, you know, that's just too much. So I tend to be spiritual. And so I said, you know what, I'm trying to do all of this. 
and I can't do it on my own, so I'm just going to wait and be patient and see what God has for me. And so my thought was, you know, I'm loving life. I can do what I want to do. I've got a gig that's permanent. Well, one day in walks my criminal chief, and she says, um, Verna, I hear the Judge Brown is going to retire. She has the inside scoop because her husband used to be the court administrator for Georgia. So she says, I hear Judge Brown will be retiring. I think you need to think about putting your name in the hat. Of course, at this point, nobody had even been talking about Judge Brown retiring because nobody really knew. Um, but because she had the inside scoop, she told me that. And I thought, okay, I said, that's nice. But, you know, I'm thinking, she's my supervisor. She loves me. You know, I do whatever she asks me to do. So, of course, she would say that. So I just rock on along doing my cases. And then a, third, a second person came to me. And I, can't, I can never recall who that second person was. And I just thought, that's nice. But then my boss, the U.S. attorney, Michael Moore, came and he said, can we talk? And he shut the door to my office and he sat down and he said, look. You need, people have come to me, they've asked me for names, you need to consider this, I want to put your name in. And so I, for the first time I kind of listened and I thought about it and I said, let me um, think about it and I'll get back with you. And I, because Mr. Moore and I are close, I may have said, let me pray about it. So I closed my office door and I got down on my knees and I prayed and I said, I, you know, I've been asking for two or three years, I want to do more. I feel like I'm supposed to do more. I'm very involved in the community, very active in organizations that are about helping people, about children. And I thought, maybe this is the more I'm supposed to do. But I told him, I said, okay, this is the deal. I'm going to put my name in, but I'm not doing all that political wrangling and, you know, trying to call in favor. I'm not doing that. If it's for me, it'll be for me. And so I did everything I'm supposed to do. I put in three recommendations. I didn't go around getting names on a list of people who supported me. I just put in three recommendation letters. I did all the things you're required to do. Um, and then um, I went to interview with the JQC. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, JNC, the Judicial Nominating Committee, and um, 19, 20 people around the table, scariest time of my life, my heart was like, um, much like first year, just like, just like first year, um, and I made it to the short list, and then I interviewed with the governor, and my only prayer was, let me go in here and represent Macon well, let, let me show them we're not country, we're very astute, and we have good legal minds in middle Georgia. And so when I walked out of the interview, I thought, man, I knocked that out of the park. So everybody was waiting on my response, and I just put, I rocked that. <laughs> and so my thought was, you know, if I get it, that's fine. But if I don't, I know that I've made them wake up and think, wow, making this on the map. So um, that's how I got to be here. Let's step back for just a minute from uh, your, your experience as a judge, and let's talk about those various experiences that you had as a lawyer uh, leading up to that. As you know, what these students are doing is they're, they're studying the profession and what they can expect and how they should conduct themselves, and they're studying loosely defined professionals. Did you encounter anything in those years that you would describe as, a, as an issue of professionalism? And if so, what was it and how did you handle it? You know, I thought about that question a lot. Um, and I will talk in general terms. Okay. Yeah. So during my profession, I have, as a female, had the occasion of um, male counterparts um, say things that probably, well, they're not appropriate, you know. Um, from a personal standpoint, um, maybe, you know, things to suggest that something could be um, nefarious outside of the professional setting and the way I handle it as a woman is I just didn't address it I just kept doing my work um, and when I accepted this award recently from Career Women's Network um, we go up and we give our little speeches and I didn't know what to say because I thought okay I've got to speak on being a woman in the profession but I will tell you and I say this to every woman here and I say this to men here as well I just I just never defined myself as being just African American or just woman. I'm just me. And I'm just me being excellent at what I do. And so I never allowed classifications to define who or what I would bring to the profession. And so when you don't do that, you don't allow negative things to kind of cloud your 
vision of where you're going. So I just never thought, I just didn't address it. So that's on that issue. Um, you will deal with people throughout your career who will be, have no professionalism. I mean, none. And I, I dealt with that too. And what that does for you, see, I, I look at the positive. The glass is always half full for me. It just redefines who you want to be as a profession, professional. So you look at them and you think, that's not what I want to be. That's not what I want to do. And it gears you up to be more of what you want to be, to do more of what you want to do. And so you're going to encounter that, but you would in any profession. So I don't understand why people come to the legal profession and expect things to be different. And you just don't give in to the negative. No matter who you are, what your, your vein may be. And that even relates to this thing in law school about grades. And I have to get this in. Um, know why you came. And I hope it's something beyond who you are personally. If it was about getting some initials behind your name, I'm sorry, you have made the best, worst investment in your life. Because that's not what this is about. And contrary to popular belief, this is a service profession. That's why the alternate name for attorney is counselor. Look up the word counselor. What does that mean? Someone that people confide in, to believe in, to guide them. And if that is not a part of your picture and what you want to do, do something different. Because you're wasting space and you're wasting your time. You will never be effective. So if that wasn't the reason why you came, somehow build that into whatever you, you're going to do. Because if you don't build that into it, you're defined what Professor Logan and I went to law school about. You're, profined, you're defined what this profession is supposed to mean. It's about service. So I don't care if you go to the silk stalking law firm in Atlanta or D.C. or New York. If you don't make a part of your mantra to serve, to do something outside of making the money, making the name, you will never truly succeed in this profession. Give back. Do something for someone outside of yourself. Don't focus on the fact that you've got a JD behind your name. Because that and the bag of chips really means nothing. <laughs> it's about what you give to the service of others that's going to count and give you a long-lasting professional life that you can be proud of at the end of the day. And I'm not telling you this because it sounds good. I'm telling you this because this is the life I've lived and that's what I know to be true. And if you will do that, everything else will fall in place. You're going to have enough money to do what you need to do because that's how life works. Life works for those who work. But don't make it all about you. Please don't do that. been a judge almost two years. You said you encountered as a lawyer problems that you would define as problems of profession. I bet you've seen some of that from the bench. <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit about what you've seen that disturbs you from the lawyers that you would describe as a lack of profession and how as a judge you have dealt with it? Because you can't just ignore it no. as the judge. So what have you seen that upsets you, and how do you deal with it when it happens? Civility. I think sometimes we get very passionate about what we're doing, and sometimes we forget civility. And that just means treating each other the way we would want to be treated, even if we were outside of a courtroom. You know, it's, it doesn't cost you anything to be kind and be respectful to one another. And I think that pull up, that brings you further along in your cause. And so sometimes, as a judge, I've had to say to people, um, remember what the profession is all about. And I've had to say it in front of a jury, unfortunately. Lay people expect more of us. They expect us to act as the professionals that we are. And so when I have to say that in front of a jury, that saddens me because that takes our profession down a notch. And we give it to all the things that TV says that we are. And we should rise above that. We should, we should make them see that this is not just something you see on TV. That this is, you know, we can work in a setting where even though we disagree, we don't have to be disagreeable. Um, and I encountered that even practicing law. I'll never forget, um, a girlfriend and I tried a big pill mill case together. Um, and I was like the third counsel they had put on the case with her. And um, she being my best friend, came to me in tears with my supervisor, the one I mentioned, and she said, would you please help me try this case? So we did an eight-week long trial, and at one point, I, um, one of the attorneys, he was older, you know, you know, trying to 
keep up with all the millions, the, it felt, felt like millions of notebooks we had. And so she would get mad at me because I would go back to him and turn to the page. And before we got there, I said, look, this is the page we're on. And, you know, of course, the jury could see me doing this. The judge could see me doing it. And she was furious with me. When she sees it, she's probably going to say, why did you tell that story? But she was furious with me. And, and I, she said, stop helping them. And I said, but how do we lose from helping and you know what? I didn't know this, um, but, the, but I was told the judge was impressed with me. That that kind of made him think of me in a way he had never thought of me before. And I didn't do it for that reason. I just did it because that's just the, the right thing to do. If you see your opposing counsel struggling to find something, even if you have a copy of the picture that they want to introduce in evidence, what is it off of you to say, here, I have a copy? I mean, you don't know what that does in a juror's mind. This person's got to be telling the truth. They're so willing to give and help, so their side must be right, because they don't have anything to hide. They don't, have, they don't have a reason why they're trying to squirrel things away. You don't win being mean-spirited. And in fact, that impression is going to stay with that judge. Whenever they see you, that image is coming back. I think I do a great job of saying, remove that. It's a clean slate, start anew. I make myself say that. But how many people would do that? Not very many. And so civility is something I just want to implore. Because, you know, this competitive spirit that law school gives you, you've got to let that go once you leave. I mean, you, of course you're going to be competitive, but be competitive by being excellent. That's how I bridge that gap. My thought was, nobody's going to know the case better than me. Nobody's going to have prepared more than me. Nobody's going to spend as many hours more than I have getting ready. So that way, when I walk in the courtroom, I can be kind to you because I got this. <laughs> you know, because I've got it together. And so if you do that, then you can be kind. You can be nice because you know, man, I've done more than this person has on the case. I'm going to win, you know, particularly if you're on the right side. So. <laughs> well, when you first became judge, was there anything that surprised you about what it's like to be on that side of the bench? Lonely. I have never been so lonely in all my life when I first took the bench. You know, if you can't tell, I'm very social, very personal. So my office at the U.S. Attorney's Office was the place where people would come and chat, to talk about cases, to talk about life, to laugh. And um, so I was used to having people in and out of my office, my colleagues from next door. All of my legal assistant, assistants were my friends. They became my friends because I was always fighting for the little guy. So, you know, I always stood up for them. I always acknowledged their importance in my world, which is important. <laughs> Acknowledge the, the little people that they say, but they're not so little. They're the reason for your success. And so I had a lot of friends. I always had people to talk to. And once you become a judge, people kind of, it's different. Lawyers, you know, they know you have to give an appearance of impropriety. I mean, of, you know, not having any impropriety. And so they, they don't want to ask you to lunch. Um, your other colleagues have been on the bench for a while, so they're doing their own thing at lunchtime. They're, you know, each of us are our own little islands. We have our chambers that you stay there. And so I wasn't used to being isolated. So one day I went into Judge Sims' chambers. He and I are close, and we're right next door to each other. I'm like, man, this sucks. I said, I feel so lonely. He said, don't worry, it'll pass. I felt the same way. And he was right. I don't feel that way anymore because I'm, my schedule is so busy. Many times for lunch, I'm doing lunch meetings or doing something connected to my profession or my outreach in the community. And so I've gotten past that. But that was the initial thing. It was very lonely. Um, and many times you can still feel that way, but I know that's just a part of the job now. And it's a part of me doing what I do. And so it's become a little bit easier. Well, as a Superior Court judge, you, you have a variety of kinds of cases that you, you might preside over. Uh, civil cases, divorce cases, criminal cases. Uh, do you have a favorite? Oh yeah, my favorite is mental health court. Um, that's an accountability court. It's non-traditional um, in that it's not a court that's geared toward prosecuting and putting people in jail. It's a court geared toward getting them healthy, living the lives they need to live. And so most of our participants are dual diagnosis. They have a drug addiction as well as they have a mental health issue. And many times the drug addiction comes because they don't want to use the medication because it makes them feel off. And so they start using drugs. So typically they come in a foul with the law. Um, we review cases and see whether they're clinically appropriate for our program. And they come in our program. And I will tell you, to see people's lives change, to see them become 
these people that they didn't think they could become, to see people hold down jobs that they've never had in their lives, to realize the value of taking their medication, to renew relationships with family is amazing. It's transformative and it gives me um, renewed strength to do what I do um, because what you see on the video, which I didn't know was being recorded, um, I think of those sessions with um, the youth as being my time for intimacy so they can know that I care about them and feel my passion for all that they can be. And so I was a little um, at first taken aback when I came in from one of my court sessions and my um, judicial assistant said, you, you know you're on TV now. And I'm like, what? <laughs> um, but after I stood back, I got some perspective and realized you know, things happen the way they're supposed to happen, so that's okay. Um, but that's kind of who I am in all of my courts, and, but no health court, I can be that way, that's what it's all about. So it's, it's speaking life into these people's lives and seeing them change, and um, we're gonna have a graduation this coming um, Thursday, and to see someone who at one point didn't feel like they were worthy, and now he's going into management. And to know that I was a part of that, that he heard me when I said, you can excel. You can be anything you want to be. Okay, we're going to leave this job if they don't recognize your talent. So let's work on the resume. And so he started believing that and started incorporating that in his life. And then he got the offer to be in management. I mean, that's what it's all about, affecting people and helping them change. And so that's why I guess I'm different than most judges, because I see my role outside of just processing. I think I'm there for people, and that's about the service part of this profession that I am so totally committed to. Well, all of the people in mental health were there initially because they had run afoul of the law in one way or another. Exactly. Uh, and so one alternative is to process them. Uh, and you're talking about something that is very different mm -hmm. and that is relatively new in the grand scheme. That words like graduation, not a familiar judicial term. That's true. Um, explain your role as the judge in the mental health court. I mean, we know what judges do when we're dealing with criminal things, being tried or being guilty of it. But as the judge in the mental health court, how do you define your role? Well, I went to one of the graduations of my, one of my participants, um, when they start relapsing and using the drugs in such frequency that we can't service them, um, rather than put them out, I make them go to a, a facility that's designed to just specifically target that drug addiction and deal with it to get them back on track. And it's kind of like a intensive rethinking that I do on a longer scale in a shorter period of time. And so I went to her graduation in Wrightsville um, on Saturday um, because she had finished the program. And her grandmother, who's been with her the whole time, she stood up and she said, this judge here, she doesn't... How did she say it? She doesn't beat. She beats the brakes or something. She'll put you in jail, but she'll also help you. And so it's. <laughs> it's and when she said that, I kind of thought, yeah, she's right, I guess. And the way I think my participants describe me, it's tough love. I, I, it's a dual role if you do it right. I think I am their strongest advocates and supporters. But even as I have to send them to do stits in jail, because we have a sanction grid, and so once you move up the sanction grid, you, you go from community service, then you go to 24 hours in jail, 48, 72. After 72, you're subject to having a uh, full hearing. But we have so many things in between that to kind of get you back on track. So you've been in the program for a while and kind of work your way up to get to a 72 hour. But as much as I care for them and I will be there to help them get every resource they can get even expending my own resources to do it, I tell them, this is not a joke. This is life one-on-one. -on -one. And so either you're going to get it and conform with the program, or you're going to have to go to the criminal system. Now, I can do one of two things, whichever, one you want to, whichever way you want this to go. We can go the easy route, or we can go the hard route. So even as I'm sending them off to jail for their 24, 48, 72-hour stint, I'm speaking words of positiveness in their life, but I'm telling them, this is real. So don't, don't get it twisted. Don't think just because I care about you and I'm willing to do something to help you that I'm not going to make, you've got to deal with the consequences. And so they, <laughs> it's the funniest thing. My people go to jail and most of the time they have a smile on their face. You're right, Judge, I messed up and I'm gone. <laughs> it's the mindset I start trying to get them to think. There are consequences for everything we do, good or bad. 
and you got to accept it. Now that doesn't change who you are, um, but it's just the way it is. I had a gentleman come and see me, um, and he is six six three, um, white guy, very strapping, and he sits in the chair and he just says, "I had to come see you," and he just starts crying and he's trying to hold it back. And I said, "Look, you know, I don't understand why we stop being human." I said, it's okay to be, it's okay for you to be emotional. I get it. This is life 101, and it's not easy, and it's harder than that. I said, so just talk to me. And he said, you know, when I came in the courtroom, you saw me. You saw me, and you met me where I, I was, and I haven't gotten in trouble. And I just had to come back to say to you, thank you, because you saw me. And so that's what it's about, seeing people. But seeing people, but also making them, holding them accountable. Because people really want structure. They really do. They just don't know it. And sometimes I have to give them structure in the way of, you got to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and I think people know it comes from a place of sincerity. And whether they do or not, and some people I've said along, I don't reach everybody. One gentleman, you know, his family was crying. I was trying to reach out to him. And I said, do you want to say anything to your brother before you go off? There's nothing to say. And I looked at the family, I said, he's gone, he's lost. Maybe he'll come back, but you know, the only thing I can give him is the penal system. And so I sent him off and he went for a pretty long length of time. But you know, it's just about reaching people. And that's what accountability court is. So it's a twist with everything. It's the, it's the building up, teaching them about structure, their life, the importance of their medication. But it's also about recognizing that there are consequences. So we do have both in that vein. But it's not just go to jail and we're not going to address your, your needs. Because if we don't address their needs, they're coming back through the system. And so I will tell you quite, off, quite candidly, the success rate in mental health court is about a 40% success rate. Because you're dealing with huge issues. But 40% is a huge impact to our local budget. 40% is a huge impact to the budget of the state of Georgia. And that's why Governor Nathan Deal, I applaud him for his efforts at criminal reform. I don't care what party you're in, what your affiliation is, that what he did with criminal justice reform, if you all don't know this, it was renowned. It is being copied throughout the United States because it's a different way of dealing with what we've come to see as the criminal justice system. We can't jail our way out of this. We've got to address the issues that face people. And so for that, um, and that's probably why I knocked it off the park with him, because I just love that criminal justice reform, and I could repeat back to him everything he did, because that impacts so many different communities, so many different people, and um, I just think it's the best thing. But every judge doesn't necessarily like accountability courts. I just buy into it full force. Some judges feel like that's not our role. Our role is just to be judicial and, and, and deal with the law and the repercussions that the law brings. And I... You know, maybe that's that missionary part coming in. I don't know. No, um, no <laughs> I just, I, you know, I kind of see my role as multifaceted, and so. You say a forty percent success rate. Mm -hmm. uh, define success. Thank you. So success is living better than you did. Living better than you did. Well, if I can graduate someone from this program and they recognize, I'm worth it. I matter. I have to have people, whether they're in mental health court or um, criminal court or even domestic court, sometimes I, I make them recognize I matter. I'm important. My life has value. If I can get them to recognize that and it has even more value when I take my medicine, that's success. So everybody can't graduate mental health court having a job, becoming a manager. Some of them graduate just knowing when I take these pills, I don't have any negative encounters with law enforcement. When I don't take my pills, I go to jail every three or four months. And just getting them to say that to me, Judge, I know if I take my medicine, I, won't, I have to come visit you in your chambers because I won't get to come see you in court. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and you know, I have an open door policy. They can, I'm very different in this way too. They can come to my office at any time. If it's an emergency, I tell them I'll get off the bench to entertain you for a brief moment. But you come to my office, call my legal um, judicial assistant, and she will make an appointment for you. So my participants come in my chambers, we talk. My team knows that I will report to them anything they tell me because I have to protect their rights. But my team has 
and I guess it's because of who I am, they trust me enough that they say, when they need to see you, Judge, we want them to see you. Because my coordinator reminds me all the time, studies show the more involvement a judge takes in these participants, the more they personally invest, the better they do. And if my role is to make them live full lives, to not keep coming back in and out of the system, that's what I need to do. And so that's what I did. Let's talk about your role outside the mental health mm -hmm. court because you, you know, that's not even close to all that you no. do. You, <laughs> you have jurisdiction over uh, other kinds of criminal cases. And let me, let me start this way. Is, is there a typical criminal defendant? When, you, when I say criminal defendant in your court, what do you see? Well, let me tell you what I do. I do all of the narcotics for Macon Bibb County. I do one-third of the civil docket. Um, I do um, any conflict domestic case uh, that Judge Raymond, who practiced um, domestic law for 26 years, many times he will conflict out of a case. So all of those cases that he conflicts out of domestically, I do those. Mental health court, family violence court, um, and I do consider the consequences which you all saw. And so that means I do every, I do a little bit of everything we do except for the major violent felonies. Um, Judge Sims does those exclusively. Um, and, and the property crimes, Judge Ennis does those um, crimes. And so there's not a typical day for me. So I may go into a hearing about um, DOT condemnation, um, discovery issues, um, one minute, then the next Couple, that may be a whole day. Then the next couple hours, I may have a, um, a set of pleas I have to do, criminal trials, civil trials. Um, I love it all because it challenges me in different ways. Like, I love the civil and having to intellectually um, analyze the case law and figure out what, what does the Court of Appeals want me to do in this situation, which they never address. Um, or what does the Supreme Court want me to do in a situation they've never addressed, which I had um, on the bench, and they told me how to address it by reversing it. Um, so, <laughs> so I've heard that before. Um, not one universal, as, at least up to this point. And, um, and so it's not a typical day. And so there's no typical criminal defendant. All of them come with different holes in their heart. Because let's, let's be honest, all of us Im imperfect individuals. None of us are perfect. And all of us have something that's missing. I've, I've yet to miss to meet anybody who's perfectly, everything's perfect in life. So all of us have a little something different that's missing. And so I can't say there's a typical criminal defendant. Some of them are pliable and some of them are not. Some of them I do my, my court reporter will tell you her pleas are never five, ten pages long. They're usually 20 or 30 because I speak to where they are. So when my narcotics defendants come before me, I look at their history I'm like, what's going on? Let's talk. Right now the only thing I care about is you. Let's talk. And so I try to meet them where they are and deal with that issue. Because my thought is, if I don't address that issue, they'll be back in my court, in Judge Sims' court, in Judge Ennis' court. They will be back in somebody's court. So let's deal with the issue. And I'll tell them, if, if something about them strikes me, I do something else that's different from my brethren on the bench. I will say to the probation, they stay with me. That means if they have any problems on probation, they have to see me. They can't go to any other judge. Because my thought is, how do I monitor that situation and make sure I'm doing all I can to make them better, to make sure they don't come back through this system if I don't hold them accountable? So I always say, you know what that means if you stay with me, don't you? And because they've kind of gotten to know me through the system, yeah, that means I'm going to get it. <laughs> and I say, yeah, you're going to get it. It may be good yet, but it may be a bad yet, but you're going to get it because I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm not letting you slip through the cracks. And believe it or not, this is hard to believe because I it's hard for me to see it. They when they come back to me, even when they're wrong, there's a sense that they want to be held accountable, that they want to get their lives together, that they want to get it right. And so I'm the one to try to help them do it. And if they don't, then they just have to deal with the consequences. Um, and so there's not a typical criminal defendant, uh, but all of them have some semblance of a hole in their heart. Well, you invest yourself in some of these people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent of writing letters to them in prison and mm -hmm. then writing you. How do you decide who to invest in and who not to? You couldn't possibly invest in everybody that comes before you. You're right. You're talking about physically, <laughs> humanly impossible. How do you decide who to invest in? 
Okay, Candid 101. Um, well, I told you why I, I prayed about doing this, and my prayer was, use me. Um, and I, I have to be candid because that's who I am. And so every day I pray, give me the spirit to know, to feel when I need to do what I need to do, and give me the gumption to do it. And so I will just tell you, something will hit me about a certain individual, and I said, I'm writing you, and you're going to write me back, and I'm going to send your staff to write me back, and I'm going to send you books, I'm going to inspire you, we're going to stay in touch. And, you know, it's funny, because every time I do that, it's like the right person. And so I've got people, I've got a young man who I met in a bond here. Now, he's not my case, because I preside, so this week I presided, so I have to do bonds. Um, he's charged with murder, 17 years of age, and he just hit me. And I said, young man, this is not what you were meant to be. So he and I have become pen pals. And he sent me his report card, A's and B's. Analytical geometry was the only one he struggled with, and that was a C. I'm like, dude, analytical geometry, what is that? I can't even imagine going to see. So I'm, you know, I read him back and say, okay, what kind of book do you want me to send you? And I send him books that he write, articulate, smart, attract. I, I'm like, what went wrong? But, you know, we can't talk about your case because I, you know, I, I won't preside over it anyway because it's a major felony, but we can't talk about your case, but I can inspire you. And so we write back and forth. So I will just tell you something about the person, the situation that hits me. And sometimes I will say, I'm writing you first. Those are the people that hit me. And then other people who I may feel something about, but I'm not sure, I give them, my court reporter keeps my cards. I said, I'm going to give you this card. You write me. If you want to reach out to me, you write me. If you write me once, you will never have to wonder if you'll get another letter from me because I'm writing you back. And I will be your pen pal throughout this process as long as you want me to be. And so I just write them back. And so I take letters home and I do handwritten letters. I don't believe in typing letters. You know, all of this technology has gotten us away from connecting with people. And I am going to connect with people. And people know you care when you take your time. And you all know how time consuming it is to do handwritten letters where you're thinking about the person, thinking about what you're saying. So I write them handwritten letters um, back and forth and we just keep it coming. And so my staff will say, how can you keep up with this? Well, I take letters home. When I'm not on the bench, I'm writing letters if I'm not doing research. Um, and so that's my, I just feel like, and you'd be surprised how many people just want to connect. And so if I pick up a book, I think of somebody who I'm writing, I see a book, I pick it up and I send it to them. And so we talk about the book and what they got out of it. And, you know, the difference it might make in their life. So that's how I do that. I, I, I didn't warn you I was going to ask you this. Okay, that's okay. But it occurred to me. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite particular success story? And you may not feel comfortable talking on camera about particular My success story of somebody else so that, that, that I've dealt with. Or that you've dealt with, that, that where it's made a difference. And you can say yes, but you don't want to talk about it on camera. That, that's fine. I'm trying to think, what story do I give? And I don't know if I've been on the bench long enough to see one, and it's from the beginning to the end. But I can t I'll tell you generally about one. I understand one of my um, participants in court, when they initially came to court, they were so sick that They were so sick that they publicly displayed themselves in a way that it would bring tears to your eyes if I told you. I would just say that. Um, <coughs> and they walked into a police station um, looking that way, demented, outside of anything that you could, whatever your worst thought about how a person could present, um, nude, um, dead animal, about their person, just so, so far from the realm of reality. And to see this person now, and to go to lunch with them, and for them to be able to talk and speak and share in ways that are just like anybody else. If you didn't know, you wouldn't know. It's phenomenal. And before that person presented that way, was a successful business owner. Comes from money and had gotten to that state. And then to go to lunch with them every now and then, now as a judge. Now I wasn't with her when the journey started um, because I hadn't assumed the bench, but I 
met her toward the tail end of the journey. And I, that's what keeps me going. That's what amazes me in the, in the ability of human beings. And if you will always keep your eyes open to see people, and even for those of you in here who might be doubters about uh, my philosophy, just do this for me. You keep your eyes open. You know, I went to see that movie, Miracle from Heaven, and my favorite line, I won't spoil it for anybody, uh, but the mother says to her, no, some people, some people won't believe. And you know, I'm talking about my philosophy now, nothing outside of that. Some people won't believe. You know, maybe we should, maybe you should, and this is why I'm always hesitant when I ask, ask a certain question, maybe you should not say that. And then the little girl says, they get it when they get it. And that was the best line for me because many times I feel like people might think she's so out the park, she's so whatever, this doesn't match my je ne sais quoi with all of that in a bag of chips. <laughs> and you know what I say to you? You get it when you get it. They get it when they get it. And it's okay. It's okay if you don't get what I'm saying, but you get it when you get it. And the hope is you get it. And, and that did so much for me to come at peace with who I am as a jurist, as a person, as a lawyer. You get it when you get it. And, and so that's what I'd say. But um, You invest a lot of yourself and a lot of energy in being the kind of judge that you are. Now, you are a high energy person. I am. I probably would have been diagnosed ADHD if I was coming through this age now. <laughs> <laughs> that is such an overused um, category and diagnosis. But here's my question. You've been at this two years. Can you keep it up? As long as I'm here on the face of the earth. That's, that's what I was put here for. And that's what I have to say to you all. Find out why you're here. What's your purpose? If you hadn't figured that out now, you need to think about it. Because you're, you're going into a profession. What's your purpose? And your purpose doesn't have to be his purpose. Your purpose doesn't have to be his purpose. Everybody's got their own purpose. And nobody's purpose is wrong. Some of you all need to go to a silk stocking law firm and do what you do. And do it well. But if you want to do something that's public service, don't let the mentality of law school tell you that you, you're not supposed to do that. Sometimes you have to take the step and wait for the staircase to come. If you don't take the step, the staircase will never come. And I, you know, I have a, um, a staff attorney. And when she told me that, you know, I get close to all my staff, you can just imagine. When she told me the debt she has, I, I just could not work. I had to sit down for 15 minutes. <laughs> Because I was like, oh my Lord. And you know, I tried to give her some advice and some things to think about doing. But the one thing I've told her and I encourage her, take the step and the staircase will come. So if you want to move, move out, that's fine. The staircase will come. You will figure the money out. It will come. But don't allow what you see in your face to stop you from where you want to go. Don't do that. When you do that, you give into this culture. You give into this, the, the, the majority that says and defines what you can do and what you can be. Don't do that to yourselves. And don't allow this system of law school we have to make you define yourself any differently than what you are. You, the same person you were when you walked in this place, that's who you still are. I don't care what first semester grades say, what your rank is. You're still that same person you were when you walked in. So don't allow anything about this process to devalue. But also, let me tell you this. I don't care if you're sitting in here and you're number one. That may not mean a thing when you hit the streets. Because I wasn't number one in my class. I wasn't law review. I was mock trial moot court. But the one thing I always knew, I am who I am. And just as I am, I am enough. And it's funny how you think that. The whole world does too. <laughs> so when you all leave this place, if I'm the last person, you need to leave walking a little bit straighter, a little bit more knowing, oh, I'm, I'm it. <laughs> I respect everybody else, but I am it. And nobody can tell you differently. And I don't care if somebody from Harvard Law, we'll put it out there, UGA Law, whatever. 
no one is more equipped than you to do what you want to do. And don't let anybody tell you differently. No harm meant to my alma mater. <laughs> but you know, I know how all of that gets all done, you know. And I just want to make sure that our students know, all students, you're enough, just as you are. Well, Judge, we have two things left to do. Okay. You, may, you may have already done one of them. <laughs> but the, the two things we have left to do, of course, the student questions. But, okay. but, but before we do that, I always invite the people who are kind enough to be with us, uh, if, if you had any advice. But you've given a lot of advice. Uh, be this, you. Uh, but uh, if there's anything else by way of advice or anything else you think you want to make sure you say, regardless of what I've asked you, uh, <laughs> Or we can turn to the student questions. I think we can turn to the student questions. My biggest part was what I just said at the end. Be you. Be authentically you. Don't be anybody else. Because there's nobody who can take your place. And if you're not you, who's going to be you? So, that's it. What questions do you all have for the judge? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, I wanted to know, by being on the bench for such a short time, how did you kind of get to the point of making it your own and kind of being authentic in yourself and did you ever kind of question maybe maybe I shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. it this way and maybe I should do it like everybody else? Great question and you're right when I took the bench after being on the bench a couple of months I knew uh, I can't do it the way I've seen other people do it I can't do it the way I've seen TV do it and I you know and I battled with myself like maybe I should be more like yourself and Judge Sims and Judge Raymond um, maybe, or Judge Ennis, maybe I should be, but then, you know, one day I just got tired of fighting myself. I was like, you know what, the only person I can be is me. Me, that's who got me here, me, being who I am. I mean, my bosses knew who I was. I mean, I was, I've always, even when I was in practice, I was always this way, kind of tell it like it is. Um, and i never forget in um, federal court one time, I was, I'm the prosecutor, right? But I was telling the judge how this person deserved for him to look outside of the sentencing guideline. So the federal probation looking at me like, what? And then, you know, we were telling the story, and I kind of got teary-eyed, and so, you know, everybody knows me. So the probation officer, he just walked over in front of the judge and just gave him a box of tissues. <laughs> you know? And so I just thought, you know, I can't be anybody but me. So I just decided that's who I'm going to be. And that's why I said what I said to you all, because that's a struggle sometimes. But I just decided, you know what, I don't know. I can't emulate them because I'm not them. So the only thing I can do is be me, and because I felt like I was put in this position from a spiritual standpoint, if I do anything else, I'm defying why I thought I was there. And so my thought is, you know, I'll live and die by being who I am. So, so that's how I came to deal with it, by just accepting it. Yes, sir. I, I do find sometimes it is discouraging and so you will see about my office about my house uh, in my car all these books on you know positive, <laughs> positive, <laughs> positive, <laughs> positive. Um, in fact I went to a, a second service on yesterday and because I had some time between the two different services I took a book uh, with me a positive thinking book so I can just read it so I'm always reading things to keep me up to keep me positive and always remembering you know if I think about my journey I can be positive I mean there were times when you know life wasn't perfect for me it hadn't always been easy it wasn't easy for me in law school it wasn't easy for me when I got out you know sometimes you're gonna have people to make you feel like you can't do it you, you, you know you're not doing well enough but you just gotta keep keep that up and so that's I would encourage you all, read something outside of these law books. I hope you do that. <laughs> you know, read something. Positive thinking or something. Something to encourage you. Something to take your mind away from all this madness. Because in a way, it's, it's kind of madness, right? You know, it's madness. So you've got to do something to keep you inspired. And so that's what I do to, to keep me up. And music. You know, don't you all have that song? Like, my daughter, I think one reason why, you know, I, it's funny how things work. I think it was divinely inspired that I got this position after my son goes to college, but while my daughter is still in the process of growing up, because my son, you know, he was off the chain. He ended up, he ended up, being, he ended up being the king of his, you know, Mr. Mountain Sales, where he went to school. And stuff. So I, and Brandon knows my son, I've kind of gone through some, you know, he, 
Ooh. So I can't imagine if I couldn't be at home all the time with him like I am with my daughter. He might have been, who knows what he might have been doing. Um, and so I get, this, I get this opportunity when my daughter was very pliable is growing up. But it's wonderful because she keeps me current, right? So like we're going to a, we're going to a church service just then. I'm like, play my song, play my song. And so it's old school, new school about um, I don't know the name of it, but say it, do it, show it. it just, so it's got the old school tune, the new school tune. So she sings the new school tune. I sing the old school tune, and I listen to music that probably most judges don't listen to. It, but she teaches me everything. So we're driving, and I'm doing what do you call it, dab, name. <laughs> and I can reach people in ways that I probably wouldn't if I didn't know that. So like when the guys come up to me and you know they all you know tattooed up and got the teardrops and all and I'm like, um, dude, you know, you know, all that death, I don't have time for that. You know, I speak that I'm like what? And I'm like, yeah, I get it. But you know what? You gotta go a different route. And so then, you know, I can I can vacillate between all those worlds in ways that maybe my colleagues can't. And so I use all of that to reach them. And so, you know, sometimes with young folks, they don't hear you until you speak their language. And so I, I speak their language, just like you saw in the video with the guy, and I said, pound it up. Because seriously, that's what I told my son. Let me tell you something, because we used to have some talks. I said, I know you're exposed to everything, and you can probably do a little bit of anything. I get that. And you're not sneaking anything on me. I know what's up. And I said, let me tell you. Buddy, you better pound it and keep it moving and tell them you know I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and, and I tell the ones who come in, I say, you know I'm cray cray. If you come back in my court, you know, and they, they and they, you know, they get it then, like, oh boy, she and, and one of the um, probationers when I came up, she said, We love you, and the the, the inmates love you. They said, Man, she don't beat the drum, she's not about it. And I mean that, because I recognize they can be something and somebody. And you're not gonna, you know, like I said, anybody can be nothing. I mean, really. Don't, you know, I'm not going there. So, um, that's the answer to the question. <laughs> the, the answer is you don't let yourself be discouraged. I don't. I just, I have to keep it up. And some days I am a little, some days when I'm down, I'm just, they leave me alone in my chambers and I just have to process. But then I'm coming back up within, before I get on the bench, I'm back into my being. Because, you know, I have to do that in every court. Domestic court sometimes, which is very intense, I have to remind people, your family might not be together, but your family is still valuable. And no matter what designation we put on it, you're still a family. And you know, encourage them because that's a trying time in their life. So you can encourage people wherever they are, even in civil matters. You know, one time it was a, a litigant, and let me see if I can talk about this. Yes, I can't talk about it. It's not over. But even in situations where there may be something where someone can be basically demolished by a situation. And I will speak to that situation and say, this, you know what, we're not going to do this. This, you all work this out. Because this person shouldn't suffer behind all of this. And typically, you know, once I say that, maybe because I'm the judge, they'll say, okay, I think we can work this out, you know, because we're not going to do this. Because somebody will totally lose. And that's not right. You know, and sometimes I just call it what it is. Other questions? Yes, yes. Uh, kind of off point. Oh, no, but that's fine. You've mentioned reading a lot. Favorite book that maybe has inspired you recently? I'm trying to think of one I've finished because I've always I have all of them <laughs> in motion. Um, <laughs> or maybe one that's currently inspiring you. Um, there's this little book called God Never Blinks, um, and she um, she. She doesn't really talk about God. She just talks about life experiences and how you've got to use them for the good. You just use them for the good. And so that is funny. Uh, I can see myself in it. I mean, she, I think she talks about she went to Catholic school. They threw her out. She was married three times. She, you know, she went through like six or seven different professions. So it's just talking about her journey. So any, and, um, any books that talk about someone's journey, um, I, I love. Um, and so, and I read everything, um, self-help books, fiction books, you know, all sorts of things. I'm just always in the constant state of reading something. What, what about a book that you send to the, your defendants? You say you send them books sometimes. Yeah. What? It depends on where they are and what's going on. So, um, there's one book that I will send to people. It's about a, um, 
the kid and the CEO. And it's about him being a mentor to a kid who was going astray, and he was a CEO. And so most of the kids, most of the young people write me back and say, I get it, you're going to be my mentor like he was Tony's mentor, because that's the uh, main character in the book. Um, and then I develop relationships with them. So based upon where they are, I send them books to meet them where they are. So I will go out and look for books that I think will be on their level, that they understand, and that can reach them where they are. So we'll talk about it. Um, we talk about their families. Um, one particular kid, his mom died when he was 13, and so he's never had anybody invest in him. So what I've told him is when he's released, um, he has to report to me once a month, and we're going to work on his life plan. And I'm going to help him work on his life plan. So he's, taking his, he's doing the GED course now, so I'm going to help ensure that he takes the exam. Um, we're going to talk about ways he's going to um, go toward a different life, and he is a gang member. And I told him, can you imagine what you and I together can do if you get it together and how we can speak to kids and go out and speak to people who've gone your way. So I'm hoping I will be able to make him see a different light. And even if I don't, I'll be ready for the next one. We've got time for one more. Um, you just spoke to mentors. Who were mentors in your life, either legally, faith-based, otherwise? Okay. Ooh, yeah. so and, many. And, and, and you've got about a minute and a half. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My bosses, you know, to me, you find your mentors. Don't let them come to you. Find them. So people who you see who you want to emulate, go to them and say, hey, can we develop a relationship? I, want, I like your style. Tell them whatever you like about them. And just make that work. Because usually they'll be busy in life. But you can make that relationship work. And, they, and if they're willing to be a mentor, the kind you need, they will pour into you. So it's no one who's ever come to me and say, can you help me along this journey that I don't help? So people who see me in law enforcement, I now want some of their mentors. Some of the people who do the courtrooms for me, they'll say, can, I want to go through this journey, can you help me? So I connect with, with people who they want to do different things in their career. So you reach out to people who you want to mentor you. Well, Judge, I, I hope you can stick around for a few minutes. I'm sure there's some students who'd like to meet you and chat with you a little bit. But thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me.